Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 480 of the podcast and it is Friday the 13th of March 2020 as I record this. So today I have an interview with Danielle Trissoni, author of Literary Horror, Memoir and More. Now I read her book Angelology a decade ago. So I'm so, th- and I'm just on her email list and I was so thrilled to be able to talk to her about the boundaries between horror and literary fiction, her mixed experiences with the publishing industry and why she's considering self-publishing for her next book and much more. And it's always interesting to talk to someone after you have read their memoir and And uh, it was just lovely talking to Danielle because I'm a total fan of her writing and I know you're going to find it interesting. In publishing news, uh, I shall come to world things in a minute, but good news. (laughs) Let's start with good news. The end of VAT on ebooks in the UK. Now, uh, this will end on the 1st of December 2020, and you might not think it will affect you because it's here in the UK, but it does affect you. Let me explain. So, 20% tax on ebooks and newspapers will end on the 1st of December, which makes it in line with print books here in the UK. Uh, Audiobooks will still have it. Hopefully, that will change at some point. But this is good for all of us. So, if you go onto your KDP dashboard, I'm assuming you self publish, um, and hopefully, they are hoping that public just pass this on through. Uh, But if you do self-publish, go to your KDP dashboard or your other dashboard uh, and look at the pricing tab. Now, for all the European countries, Japan, India and Australia, there is a second price next to the price you set. So just referring to um, the dashboard. So, for example, for a £2.99 book, it will say £2.49 without UK VAT. So that's 50p that goes um, to Uh, you know, for value added tax, which is one of our taxes. But this is true across all European countries. There's all different rates, Japan, India and Australia who still have it. So basically, we're going to get that extra 50p in our pockets, which is really pretty good. (laughs) And this will be in the pocket of anyone who is selling books in the UK. You will have more money after December. So uh, I'm going to celebrate that. It is potentially quite a lot of money for those of us who are, um, you know, who who do a lot of marketing here in the UK. Uh, Very good news. But um, yes, since digital tax is generally being added by countries over time, this isn't this is an interesting move. So make the most of it while it lasts. So, uh, yeah, that's good news. More good news. Orna Ross posts a rebuttal to the miserable portrayal that the Authors Guild report painted a few weeks back, which I talked about. And Orna wrote an article, Why Self-Publishing Changes Everything for Everyone in Publishing. And I'll link to it uh, in the show notes. Basically, uh, just to quote from her, she says, Blending direct book sales to readers with selective rights licensing, speaking, affiliate income, teaching and other options into one of 10 possible business models, indie authors create assets that build over a lifetime's work, assets which they direct and own. Valuing publication over validation, thinking globally and not territorially, collaborating rather than competing and proudly carrying self-respect into all our ventures, negotiations and collaborations, indie authors create assets. More authors are succeeding today than ever before by understanding the value of our intellectual property, by engaging our ability to create digital assets, by moving beyond old concepts of authorship, by respecting how books readers buy books and book related products today, more authors can succeed tomorrow. The foreseeable future belongs to the author entrepreneur, but the artist authors, maker authors and professional authors can all integrate a creative and entrepreneurial approach to their activities. 
When we do, we grow opportunities not just for ourselves, but for all authors. So a wonderfully empowering uh, article from Orna, as most things that Orna does. You can check that out at selfpublishingadvice.org from the Alliance of Independent Authors. Link in the show notes. But yes, being empowered is uh, definitely part of the mission. So clearly on the world stage, it has been a weird week. Um, this week I turned 45, <laughs> which is quite a significant birthday. Uh, definitely, uh, well, let's not call it middle age, <laughs> but technically in that realm, I guess. I also deadlifted 80 kilograms, which I was really pleased about because I did have a goal for 75 for my birthday, but I did 80 for three reps, which I was pretty happy with. So hooray, strong woman and healthy writer, uh, which is good. But um, actually it was on my birthday that uh, the World Health Organization announced a pandemic and Donald Trump announced a ban on European flights and oh yes, the markets crashed. (laughs) So definitely an interesting week. We're in for a bumpy ride. Now, uh, I I did want to comment briefly because, of course, this is affecting lots of people. But um, everyone listening is in a different place physically, mentally and emotionally. Uh, So this is going to be a different experience for everyone. But what I wanted to say is uh, please listen to public health experts and epidemiologists and people who actually understand viruses. Uh, Don't listen to people who do not have degrees and are not experts in this area. Just to say, I personally have um, vulnerable people in my family who I love and I'm worried about, and I imagine you have as well. I also have friends who are doctors and medical staff who are on the front line in intensive care units. So yeah, like many of you, this is a worrying time. And it's essentially a time for empathy. Even if you don't feel that you're affected, then please be empathetic uh, to those who do have uh, people that they're worried about, even if you personally don't think you're at risk. It's actually a time to make decisions that benefit society, not just the individual. And that's why public health experts are the ones to listen to. And I think was discussing this with my husband, who actually is a medical statistician. (laughs) And we were talking about public health. And I said, because I have no uh, training in biology at all, I didn't even do a GCSE, which is like sort of 14 to 16 year old. I uh, didn't even do it then. So um, I think public health, given that most of us have not lived through a public health emergency, it can be really hard to consider this and understand um, the type of things we actually need to do. So if you're not in a place where things are changing at the moment, then this might seem over the top, but it is a reality for many of us. And certainly here in Europe, um, those of us who know the area of Italy, which is um, very affected, it is a reality and it will become more of a reality every week. So I am personally cancelling all my travel for the next few months, uh, even to London, I'm uh, just going to stay home. And also social distancing, hand washing, all the sensible things that experts are recommending. And I know it's hard to concentrate. It's hard to do much else. Um, But this will be the new normal for a while. So hunker down. And also, as I mentioned last week, write out your fears. I have actually been journaling like a crazy person this week. <laughs> a lot of journaling. Um, I think part of that is is the 45th birthday. It's uh, what's going on in the world. It's um, just and my futurist brain also is going into hyperdrive as I play out in various directions what this might um, impact over time. And yeah, so basically journaling definitely helps and uh, you will find your own way to deal with this. But um, yeah, listen to public health people. That is the best idea. Uh, Obviously, this week I've written zero words on Map of the Impossible, my novel. I feel like it's just, you know, you need to concentrate to delve into a fictional world. So uh, I've just, again, given myself a week off. (laughs) And uh, but next week I'm back to it. 
What else has been happening? This week has kind of been really weird because it was meant to be London Book Fair. Lots of us did meetings online that we would have done in person. Uh, I did a panel online that would have done in person. Lots of kind of weird things going on. I did speak at the self-publishing show live last Monday, uh, which is uh, Mark Dawson and James Batch's events uh, associated with the self-publishing show podcast. And uh, I did a 40-minute keynote session on multiple streams of income. Now, it that was kind of touch and go even up to the day whether it would go ahead. Um, but it did go well and uh, probably two thirds of people turned up. Uh, so it was a good day and lots of people have been asking for my talk. And I did actually work really hard on my talk um, on multiple streams of income. It was the first talk was Louise Ross on Kindle and how her career has progressed. So I wanted to do something that was very much the opposite. Um, So if you want to do, you know, write fast in genre fiction, publishing KU and use Amazon ads, this is not the talk for you. (laughs) But if you want to uh, do multiple streams of income and have a career more like mine, then uh, I have turned this talk into a mini course slash lecture. So I've basically broken it down into a number of videos. There's also audios and uh, transcripts with links and notes and slides at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. So I have uh, made this available as an online course at a uh, low price. So um, you can go check that out. If you're a Patreon, a patron, you get a uh, 10% off. So hopefully that is, and if you've bought one of my courses before, you get 20% off. So yes, hopefully you will find that useful at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. A number of people asking about audio for authors on Audible. (laughs) I would love for it to be on Audible. Uh, And in fact, I loaded it up on the 18th of February. So as this goes out, we're pretty much at a month that it's been sitting on ACX. Apparently, they have a really big backlog at the moment, and this is impacting a lot of people. Uh, This is one of those reasons I really, really want pre-orders on audiobooks, because why shouldn't we have things go live on the same day? Uh, But anyway, if you're desperate for the audiobook, it is on iTunes, Google Play, Kobo Audio, and also everywhere in ebook and print. Uh, Thank you for the reviews, and uh, reviews always welcome if you find the book useful. in useful stuff today. So of course, in-person events may be impacted by the coronavirus outbreak, but online events will continue. (laughs) Uh, It's good to have a virtual community in these times of craziness. So I am doing a free webinar with Alex Newton from Kalytics. Now, if you don't know uh, Kalytics or Alex, basically Alex is just a brilliant data nerd. And uh, he would be fine with me saying that as a, you know, it is a compliment for data nerds. And he essentially every month, he analyzes the Amazon categories, subcategories, um, does reports on different genre trends with the latest data, updates, keywords, um, graphs, and he updates this stuff all the time. And I love having a friend like Alex who does the work because it is not something I do or enjoy or am in fact capable of. (laughs) So if you would like to come and hear a webinar with Alex on mastering Amazon data in 2020 to sell more books, then come along and join us at thecreativepen.com forward slash mar26, M-A-R-2-6. So yes, that is on March the 26th. (laughs) Uh, Usual times, uh, although because of the time difference, it's going to be 4pm US Eastern, 8pm UK. And uh, we'll be going through how Amazon data can help you save time, money, creative resources and sell more books. The simple steps that let you find, utilise the best categories that are right for you, your books and your goals a surprise premiere in the audiobook market and some tips and tricks that you do not know yet. Uh, So that is Alex from Kalytics free webinar on 26th of March 2020. Come along at thecreativepen.com forward slash mar26, M-A-R 26 and links in the show notes.
So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. I love seeing your pictures. We have lots of pictures this week. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone who sent me pictures. Just a few. Thanks to Claire Sager for a photo from the Brompton Cemetery, one of Victorian London's magnificent seven. To Barry Pierman, who sent a picture from New Zealand with an inquisitive horse. To Demi Stevens for a lovely smile. And Sandy Day for a excellent kitchen work in progress picture and to Valeria Marcon or Marson who posted a gorgeous picture with the her print edition of audio for authors always wonderful to see pictures of our books in the wild and um also wanted to uh Oh, Gil Grimes says, listening to the podcast from my desk in the surgery, reviewing labs and pondering life. I imagine everyone in the medical profession is pondering life. So stay safe, Gil. And finally, two people uh, emailed me and commented about DeepL. So last week I mentioned that DeepL.com, the translation engine, released a new version. And Claire Hanscom says, just did a quick test of DeepL. As a bilingual linguist, I wanted to be vindicated in my scepticism, but I have to say I'm impressed, even if it does need a lot of editing, not least because it assumes a male narrator. And so Claire basically said, I'm impressed, even though it needs some editing. And Annie Sargent said, there are many instances of unnatural French. A native would be able to tell within seconds this is not normal spoken French. Having said that, DeepL is better than Google Translate. Will they get to a point where they nail it? Maybe, but not yet. So basically, as per before, and I think in general, these artificial intelligence tools like DeepL will only ever be used for a first draft. Um, but that is a good thing. It takes away the kind of bulk uh, of work and means translators, as well as authors, can use their skills and time to finesse the manuscript. Right, today's show is sponsored by Draft Digital, and I will play a word from the lovely Kevin Tumlinson in a minute. And just to say, I um, talked about Draft Digital a lot in my session because one of the things they help us do is get into libraries. You guys know how much I love libraries, and uh, you can get my books for free in libraries just by ordering them on your app. And uh, that is all through Draft Digital, Find Away Voices, and Ingram Spark. So being wide enables you to be in libraries. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. All of you sponsoring me on Patreon, I just am so grateful to you. And thanks to new patrons, Elizabeth, Rosemary Deuce and Adrielle Brunson. I really do appreciate your support on Patreon. Like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. You can support the show for just a couple of dollars a month at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Here's a word from draft to digital and then we'll get into the interview. Hey, this is Kevin Tomlinson from draft to digital Discoverability is the key to author marketing success, but it's one of the toughest things about the business. How do readers find your work? draft digital can help with that thanks to reading lists. Built around our universal book links, d d reading lists let you create a bookshelf with customizable carousels crammed full of your books. They can be organized by series, release dates, themes, heck, even the color of your covers if you want. It's all up to you. You can also feature books by other authors, and just to make a little extra cash, you can include your affiliate links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple, Kobo, heck, even certain competitors who want to smash your words in a meat grinder. That's one of my favorites. Kevin, smash! You'll find reading lists and a whole bunch of other great promotion and marketing tools at books2read.com. Powered by draft to digital Go to books, the number two, read.com and discover discoverability for yourself. Danielle Trasoni is the multi-award winning and international best-selling author of horror novels, including Angelology and memoir, including The Fortress. She is also a horror columnist for the New York Times and a podcaster. Her latest book is The Ancestor, described as modern gothic. Welcome, Danielle. 
Hi, Joanna. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, no, I'm super excited. And as I said to you by email, I have been a fan of yours since Angelology, which is, I guess, over a decade now and very excited about your new book. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Um, So I've been writing uh, for about 15 years. My first book was published in 2006. Um, Before that, I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is, um, you know, here in the States. It's an MFA program. Um, You're in Bath, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, there's an MFA program in Bath, I believe, that's really well known um, or a writing program. But anyway, um, and uh, my first book was a literary memoir uh, called Falling Through the Earth. And um, then from there, you know, I had I'd gone into writing um, basically because I had that one story to tell. <laughs> so I, I always say that I taught myself how to write in order to tell that one story that was the memoir, which was about my relationship with my family. Um, and when I finished writing that, I was at this point where I said, what should I write next? Because I don't want to be one of those writers who write the same book over and over and over again. Um, and so I looked in you know, into my own reading habits, what I love to read. And I started writing um, about mythology and science and mystery. Um, You know, you mentioned that uh, they're categorized as horror novels, and they are in some degree horror or gothic, but more along the lines of Frankenstein, I would say, or something that the Brontes might write, might write. Um, Horror is a sort of broad term that that um, I'm often trying to redefine <laughs> in my <laughs> in my column. Um, you know, I'm choosing books that walk the line between genres. But anyway, so I embarked upon writing my first novel, Angelology, um, just throwing out everything I had learned about writing or or thought that I knew about writing and trying to invent something different. Um, so that came out in 2010, and then there was a sequel, um, Angelopolis. Um, And then I wrote another literary memoir, and here I am again. um, I'm about to publish a new book called The Ancestor, which has been described as literary horror, but is is also very much like angelology, something that mixes um, historical fiction with science fiction, with mythology and mystery, and sort of packages it all up in one book and and there it is <laughs> without a real genre, but they're categorizing it this time as, as straight out literary horror. Literary horror. Yeah. And it's, um, did you know that Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein here in Bath? Oh, no, I didn't. I knew she had the idea in, in the Alps. Yes. And everyone uh, always remembers that bit, but no, she wrote right. it here in Bath. We have, uh, that's, that's what amazing. we're famous for apart from Jane Austen. <laughs> amazing. I'm going to have to make a pilgrimage. That's oh, ab- absolutely. But um, I, I mean, I agree with you. I think what's so interesting with horror is that there is this kind of literary horror idea and many horror works are literary. Um, you know, Frankenstein, obviously, and they're putting your books there. And, um, but I wondered about, your your thoughts on this genre because I must say I definitely write I say kind of supernatural books and your books are supernatural as well but the word supernatural can often be misconstrued uh, although I think it's an important part of horror so where do you where are your thoughts on the lines between literary and genre genre horror or fiction in general especially in an era where someone like Stephen King you know 25 years ago was considered kind of pulp and now would be moving into sort of literary giant phase right I I think um personally I don't really believe in genre I believe in good writing um so I can for example pick up I get dozens and dozens of novels every month for this column that I write for the New York New York Times and I can pick up a novel that I think I would love. It has all of the elements that I would love that can be defined as, um, you know, horror, meaning dark uh, fiction, um, <clears throat> some kind of maybe some kind of creature, um, something, you know, a setup that's very scary or something that's very suspenseful. And I can open it and read a couple of pages. And if the writing is bad, I will put it down. Um, so for me, that's the definition of, of what I love in any genre. Um, as far as sort of literary conventions changing over time, I think we're in this moment be- partially because um, traditional book reviews are fading away and people are finding literature online, either through podcasts or through Goodreads, that all of these genre distinctions that were really created by the publishing industry and by booksellers and librarians to categorize books so that people could find them 
are just being thrown out the window, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that someone with the staying power, for example, of Stephen King is really just because of, um, number one, he's so prolific, but number two, he's so persistent. I don't think his writing has improved over the years. You know, I think that a literary cr critic would probably find the same flaws, um, in his writing that they found 30 years ago. But, um, he is, you know, really one of the, I guess you could say the stars of, of the horror genre. And also, I mean, he's, he's reviewing sort of more mainstream literary fiction in the New York times book review sometimes <laughs> as well. So, you know, he really has moved over. Um, but I think that that is a more of a testament to his staying power and the fact that so many people grew up reading him. Um, the snobbery around genre fiction, in my opinion, is is a shame. Um, I grew up reading everything. I would walk into a library and I would walk out with my arms full of books of every kind and I would read them. And that pleasure of just reading without those distinctions is something that I strive to, to do in my books now, mm -hmm. uh, you know creating that experience for someone else. Yeah, fantastic. And um, you obviously you've written about angels. Uh, I, we don't want to give too much away for the for the new book. Um, but also I read in, in The Fortress, your memoir, there is mention of a ghost, um, you know, that, that was in this uh, quite gothic French place you lived in, French chateau, I guess, fortress, you describe it obviously in the book. Um, and it, it sounds like these dark undertones, uh, sort of a, a part of your life and your work for a long time. So where do you think that that comes from? And how do you incorporate aspects of faith is one word or just not belief? You know, you know, that's I have it too. I'm not a Christian, but I have elements of supernatural that I believe are in my life. Well, I think, um, you know, it really did happen, you know, in my life in that I was in Catholic school as a child. <laughs> um, my, I, my family, my father's family uh, was Catholic, Italian American Catholic. Um, and I was in a school where we went to church every morning. And I remember zoning out and what I what my eye would gravitate to would be the angels and the sort of unnatural th things and creatures, I mean, if you call angels creatures that were on the walls of the church. And I became more and more fascinated with um what is, you know, what it means to be human in relationship to these uh, beings that are not human, whether that's angels or ghosts or, you know, like the, the in the new book in The Ancestor, there's a, um, I don't think it's saying too much to say that there is a kind of um, non-human creature that shows up. And, um, but the way that I love to write about these experiences of, you know, sort of supernatural or, or, um, you know, superhuman um, phenomena is very realistically that I find that if the world that I create is very, very um, researched and realistic and you walk into it as a reader feeling like it's um, literary realism and then something gradually shifts and suddenly you're in a world that you didn't know that it existed or that you didn't think you were walking into, I think that that creates um, a, a really intense experience and a believability that makes the fiction interesting. So um, I've been, you know, in my own life, I, I you know, the books that I've loved um, have always been that kind of book, whether it's, you know, a you know, literary novel or horror novel or whatever. And I, I've strive, I've tried in my own work to create that experience. Mm. Yeah. And then, oh, we've got to ask a selfish question. Uh, is there another angel book? Uh, so po there is. Possibly? But, but <laughs> so I, I'm asked this almost every week by <laughs> readers. And um, there I am going to be writing um, more of that series. What happened with that series is something, you know, that I call a hazard of the publishing industry. Um, it was traditionally published in 2010, Angelology. Um, and when I wrote it, um, I hadn't planned on writing a series, but the, the novel was such a success that um, my publisher bought a second one. And um, as I was in the middle of writing that, my editor left and I was stranded mm -hmm. <laughs> in my publishing house. And there wasn't a lot of um, 
interest in continuing the series after that editor left. So I finished that book and then I didn't really have anywhere to go. So I did something else. Um, you know, the problem being that I have a lot of people who love that series and I love that series. So I'm, you know, I'm considering actually writing the third book and self-publishing it. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think that that would be a wonderful experience. Um, you know, just in terms of me being able to control, um, all sorts of things uh, around the publication. And I wouldn't have that problem um, with, you know, being stranded and then feeling like I was in a publishing situation where um, people weren't excited for another book. Mm. Um, and then it would just be me and, the, and my readers, right? And and I could be in touch with them directly. It, it just, there's a lot of reasons why I think that that would be the best option. Yeah, well, I think that the publishing de- decision is, is definitely, you know, in that situation as well. You know, as I said, I... I've been a fan since that first book and I there are authors who you know you remember and you go and check in on them now and then and over the years I have checked in to see if there was another book um in that series you know and it was like oh it's not there maybe it'll be there at some point so I bet you there <laughs> there are other readers like me you know around the world especially I was going to say if you have you read um Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor no, I haven't. Ah, but that is a wonderful book, and there is um, there is an angel in that, um, and it 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 brought to mind your work, and that book has been huge. <laughs> um, What's the name of it? I'm sorry, I don't know. It. A Daughter of Smoke and Bone by okay. Lainey Taylor, and uh, people listening as well. I I love that book, and Lainey's fantastic. It's it's uh, meant to be YA, but it is so much more than than that. Um, she's a fantastic writer. I, I think you'd enjoy it. <laughs> I'm sure I would. I'm fascinated with the, the genre um, shift between YA and adult and how people are moving back and forth. Mm. I think that that's a really fertile place um, to be writing in. And, you know, I think a lot of my readers actually in the Angelology series were um, sort of young adult readers mm. and adults as well who wanted um, a, a sort of more supernatural and playful experience. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's it would be a good idea. I just have to, you know, I have to learn how to do it. I haven't self-published before. Oh, we, <laughs> so you have, have friends. <laughs> what? You have friends over here. So, oh, uh, good, good. Yes. I may need to ask for some help. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something I'm going to be doing this year is writing that book. Fantastic. Well, let's um, coming back to to angelology. And uh, as I said, I've just finished your wonderful memoir, The Fortress. Uh, and in it, and I, I read this sentence, so I'll just read it out for people. When success arrived, it cracked the atmosphere of my life like a sonic boom, knocking me off balance. And you talk in the book about having so many rejections and all your hard work, and yet this success seems like a real mixed blessing. So I wonder if you would kind of address, you know, what happens with success and how you would handle it now? Sure. Well, let me just give the listeners a little bit of context about what happened. Mm -hmm. So I had written one book before Angelology, and it was, as I mentioned, a literary memoir that was very well reviewed. It was chosen um, as one of the best 10 books of the year by the New York Times, and it it did very well in a literary way. Um, But as we all know, literary success and commercial success are often very different. And um, so when I wrote Angelology, I wasn't quite expecting um, it to be published in the way that it was. And it, it's one of those things It became it, it was sold at auction. Um, there were seven editors bidding the film rights sold before the book sold, if you can imagine that. Mm-hmm. Um, so they sent um, my agent sent a manuscript um, to producers in Los Angeles. And so. Um, and then it sold in 33 countries, I think, like all within three weeks. Mm, wow. <laughs> so it just, when I say sonic boom in that quote, it really just happened so quickly. Um, and also it hadn't, all of that was sort of behind the scenes. It hadn't actually gone out into the world yet. So I didn't know, is it a success because people are betting on it being a success or is it a success because my readers are going to <laughs> love it or you know what defines success and so when I say you know that it threw me off balance it really did I wasn't quite sure um how to handle it like I didn't wasn't sure but I, I had no idea about how to promote my work in such a large way that it would be ne- you know that would be necessary um for a book like that and I also wasn't sure how to interact with 
my readers. And, you know, also it was 2010. It mm-hmm. was 2000. So it was, the book sold in 2009 and it, it was published in 2010. And it was a really chain, rapidly changing world in the publishing industry then too. So, you know, I think that um, we're often trained or we train ourselves to write and we, you know, we train ourselves for rejection and negative reviews and that sort of thing. We're like, okay, I can handle it. But then when something overwhelming happens in the opposite direction, we have to sort of scramble to figure out how to, to continue writing on a daily basis and, um, you know, living our lives in a way that we can, um, continue to write. We have to learn how to do that. Hmm. Yeah. And it's, uh, and of course you had kids and, uh, you know, it was, it was all a, a busy lifetime as well. It wasn't just, you know, you straight out of your MFA, we should say, you know, you, you, you had a lot of life going on. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was, right. And I also, you know, as is, you know, detailed in the memoir, The Fortress, um, I, you know, my marriage was that I was in at that time was not working. Um, so yeah, there were many, many aspects to me feeling off balance at that point in my life. You know, luckily, um, I just love writing, (laughs) you know, so I, I continue to write books and, um, and I, I found the sort of new wonderful stability in writing every day and, and continuing to publish. And if you love the work, right? I think that everything will be fine in the end. Yeah, I love that. And um, I think Elizabeth Gilbert also talks a lot about that. You know, people have said to her after Eat, Pray, Love, oh, well, h- how does it feel knowing that your biggest work is behind you? You know, <laughs> she's like, well, I just people carry actually on. Say that? Oh, my, that's so <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, it's basically get, like cutting off half of her writing life. She yes. has a lot of life left. <laughs> <laughs> ahead of her she could write something amazing right yeah well yeah exactly and and that's um and jk rowling as well here in the uk you know if people say well why why doesn't she stop and let the rest of us uh have a go you know but she she continues to write because she's a writer <laughs> right because you really have no choice at the end of the day um it's something that you you know that be, for me anyway it becomes a kind of meditation that you know i need to do that every day otherwise i feel um, like something's missing in my life. Mm, no, fantastic. Right. Well, I, I wanted to, um, just pop back to the ancestor because I, I was listening to your writerly podcast, uh, back in June, 2019, you discussed the evolution of your title. Now you've mentioned that you might consider self-publishing because of control. And this episode was, fa- <laughs> I'll link to this in the show notes, but this episode was so interesting because you had 25 plus options for a title and we're having a very difficult time. So, um, can you tell us about this process? <laughs> of of a title why it was so difficult oh it was so actually it's just ridiculous because the original title for the book was the ancestor (laughs) and the title that is going to be published under is the ancestor but of course in the publishing world um editors and marketing people get you know they say i this in this particular instance i believe it was the marketing people at my publishing house who said oh um, the ancestor is not a very um, sellable title. It's it's not a title that's going to sell books. And so then, of course, my editor came back to me and said, "Listen, we need to find a new title." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "What?" I said, "I really love the ancestor. I don't think that there's a better title for this." And and for you know, for those of you listening, when you read it, you'll see that the ancestor is you know that that concept of ancestry and. Um, our ancestral connections to um, home and family and all of the things that ancestry means um, now and in the past is very much at the heart of this book. So removing ancestor from the title was really like shocking to me. Um, But yeah, so I came up, you know, I spent a lot of time, I came up with a lot of titles. Um, I even posted these titles not all 25, um, but I think maybe six or seven on Facebook and had a video like (laughs) showing the titles, like, which one do you like? And, you know, overwhelmingly, um, the two top choices were the ancestor or ancestral, right? Mm -hmm. Like ancestral was a second, you know, sort of finalist. And, um, finally, you know, after, Uh, me presenting a million ideas and the publishing house not being able to come up with anything better. They said, okay, well, we don't love it, but let's keep it. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so here we are, right? After all of that time. Such a big pose. But you did you did say that you came up with a whole load of titles. And I know I can hear people listening and they're saying, how do you do that? How do you come up with so many titles? Oh, well, so I think in the, in the podcast, we discussed that a little bit. Um, and my co-host on the podcast, Panio, may have said that he often goes to poetry um, and will look in, in, in poetry. But um, for me, I wanted I knew the parameters of what I wanted the book to express. And that was the book is very suspenseful. It's very gothic. Um, there, uh, you know, are a lot of elements of horror and, and, um, I wanted it to be something that when you look at the cover and you read the title, you know what it is. Mm. Um, so I really, you know, I, I veered more toward the Gothic and horror side. Right. And, and then actually the publisher didn't like that, you know, because then that also limits sales in another way, apparently, um, so they're very much, obviously like the, the, the lesson of, of all of this, the moral mm-hmm. of the story is that, um, you're, you know, the marketing people at the publishing house and so oftentimes your editor are thinking about how it's going to sell. They're not thinking so much about the aesthetics of what, what you're doing. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I know independent authors have just as much trouble deciding on a, on a title. In fact, I, uh, three after th- in three books into my first series, I chain recovered, retitled, regenerated those books. Same story. Really? Just retitled, you know, recovered. Yeah. And, and, uh, into another genre and, and they worked a lot better. So that is one of the great things about being indie. You can just go, do you know what? That didn't work. I guess I'll try something else. <laughs> did your readers, did you have readers that bought both? You know, uh, well, I made it clear, you know, you can say previously clear. published as, um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. That, what freedom. I love the freedom that you have to do that. Um, and you know, yeah, I, I've been really longing for that. Mm, which is, which is interesting, but um, I, I wonder also, cause your, uh, writerly podcast, it says it's about the intersection of writing and business. So I wondered, um, how do you think the business of being an author has changed, uh, since you've been a professional writer? Oh, completely a hundred percent changed. Um, when I began, so my, as I mentioned, my first book was published in 2006 and that was the era when essentially if you had an agent and you had a book published, you were told to sort of go away and write your next book. (laughs) You know, it's like, thank you very much for the manuscript. We may need you for a book tour. Um, we may need you to do some interviews, but other than that, please go away and write. And uh, that's just unheard of now, right? Mm. right? Authors are expected Um, to have a platform. We're expected to be in touch with our audience. We're expected to be able to um, generate interest in the book outside of what the publisher is doing. And now there's, there really are are no book tours. I mean, there are, you know, sometimes it happens. um, And, you know, with the ancestor, I'm going to a few places, but it's really what, what's happening. I mean, it's the internet, right? It's that everyone is either um, finding books or, um, interacting with, uh, their favorite authors online, um, and through, and books are being reviewed on Goodreads rather than in newspapers. So, um, you know, this revolution has left a lot of writers scrambling. On the other hand, something that I find really interesting is that, you know, there's this whole opportunity for writers who want to, do it their own way and do it outside of the publishing industry. And it's feasible in a way that that was never possible in, you know, when I started there's self-publishing was considered something that, you know, maybe you would do in your garage. Right. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that you would sell some copies, you know, on a stand at the market or like it wasn't, there was, you know, at that time, that wasn't something that, that could be done and that people could actually not only earn a living, but find their readership, um, which is what we all want, right, is to find our readers. And so um, that change is a revolution. I think of it as, you know, it's as big as the printing press for me, um, what's happening now, what, you know, the freedom we have and the ability to reach each other. It's just a whole nother world. I know of a lot of um, sort of, you know, tradi- older traditionally published authors who are really scrambling and struggling. Mm. Um, in this environment because they're just not used to it. 
Yeah, and I I know some of those people, and it's almost like the everyone wishes the old days were still here. Yeah, you know the six figure advance every year, right. like clockwork. Um, yep. But that's that. I mean, you mentioned having a platform there. Do you think that's that is expected, even if you write a literary novel, for example? I think so. Yeah, I, I think so. Even if you write a literary novel. Um, I think that the marketing people are, are Googling you before they figure out how much they're going to offer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, um, you know, literary novels, okay. They've never sold a lot of copies. Um, but now it's worse than ever. And you need, I, I mean, this is just my opinion. I re- really believe that everyone who is writing and who wants to, um, have a readership needs to connect with that readership online a whole new generation of people are and actually that i mean i don't want to i don't want to cut it off you know with millennials either but you know older people who are retired for example are online finding writers too so i would say everybody has essentially um changed their way of finding what they're going to read how they're interacting with the authors and yeah so i would say that even a literary novelist would need to have a platform Mm. And it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned the book tour there. I think this is a book tour. You're on a podcast tour. I'm on a book tour. That's right. <laughs> no, it's so much more fun. I can be in my pajamas and, <laughs> if I want. <laughs> yeah, and you can reach people all over the world, which is fantastic. So if people do want to um, make a living as a traditionally published writer these days, um, do they have to supplement that with teaching or, or or do you think that it is possible or how do you think that people should make a living with writing? Well, the people that I know that, um, that are making a living with writing are doing a number of things. Um, especially if they're traditionally published, um, they're, as you mentioned, they're teaching, um, they're publishing, uh, you know, maybe a book every other year, um, their advances may not be big, but with teaching and other things, they can make it. Um, television is becoming uh, a, a sort of viable way for writers to make a living, but it's a whole nother, um, it's another art, right? It's yes. another craft. And and to write for television, one has to really learn a new um, set of skills and also be willing to basically um, relocate. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you have to be in Los Angeles or sometimes in New York. And you have to also, you know, be, um, be willing to take lots of notes and take lots of, um, instruction and, and collaborate in a huge way. So, you know, that's one option. Um, self-publishing from, you know, you, you self-publish a lot of people listening, self-publish. I haven't done that yet. And I, I find that, um, you know, that a fascinating possibility um, and something that, you know, what I've been reading is that the way that that um, readerships are moving and the way that writer, you know, writers, the direction writers are moving into is that we will have a kind of personal relationship with our readers in a way that publishing houses used to. Um, so, for example, here in the States, um, or maybe in, you know, of, of course, in England, too, um, you would see, you know, the imprint of, of a certain publisher and you'd say, oh, that's the kind of book that I love. Mm-hmm. And I would buy, you know, oh, it's FSG or it's Faber and Faber or whatever, Serpentine. And you, you'll buy that book because you know that the, the taste of the editors and that publishing house are it's fabulous. Now that's sort of disintegrating, I think. And, and people are, um, people don't know, they don't know the publishers. They don't know that those brands are gone. And now it seems to me that writers have to develop that presence themselves and bring their, their right, their readers with them wherever they go. Mm, the author brand, uh, indeed. I mean, I don't. I, I know what you mean about that shopping by imprint, but uh, as you mentioned, when you got stranded, when you got orphaned with that second book, a lot of uh, editors move. I mean, that, that's their that's their day job. They have a salary, and, and a lot of editors move on. A lot of turnover in publishing houses, right? So, completely. That, yeah, that changes things. But um, you did you mentioned writing to TV, but on your website, I found an intriguing link to Crypto Z, an audio series uh-huh. collaboration. Yes. <laughs> I didn't mention that. Yes, so that's another exciting um, form that uh, I've been 
uh, exploring. Um, so I'll tell you the whole story. I wrote The Ancestor, which is the novel that's coming out. And it was very long. I tend to write long books. Um, Angelology, I think, was f- about 500 pages. And um, and The Ancestor was originally that length as well. And with my editor, we ended up cutting about 100 pages out of it. Mm. Um, and a lot of that material was material around uh, the subject of cryptozoology. And for those of you who don't know what that is, cryptozoology is the study or the um, the scientific investigation into animals that are not documented by science. <laughs> <laughs> so for example, um, the Loch Ness Monster would be a cryptid studied by cryptozoologists and um, the Yeti and Bigfoot. And, you know, but then there's more sort of normal animals too, like, uh, you know, large, uh, there's a large Medusa jellyfish that was, um, you know, for centuries, people were reporting that they saw this jellyfish in, in the Arctic. And finally, scientists did find it, right? So um, anyway, that's I I became fascinated with this kind of um, search. And um, while I do have a a cryptid, a creature in my book, um, we didn't need all of that information. So I took it out. And what I did is I wrote a 10-part audio drama series um, with the 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 material and some of the characters that got cut and um we me i i worked with a director um and a producer and we cast 15 people 15 voice actors um and we hired a sound designer and we created this fantastic audio experience um of cryptozoologists hunting for creatures and um yeah that's going to drop so we the way that we think about it is as a companion to the ancestor novel Mm -hmm. so we're going to release the first episode um on the day that the book is published april 7th wow and what platforms will that go out on um apple podcasts it's going to be available everywhere um, it's being um, produced by a company called Euphony, which is a narrative podcast company. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, it's going to be available. It's free. Um, you know, for those of you who haven't listened to narrative audio podcasts, it's it's a totally different experience than sort of nonfiction podcasts that we're all used to. It's really you, you slip on your headphones and you're just immersed in a, in an audio bath of experience. And so there's, um, you know, sound design. So when, you know, you're in the forest, you're hearing everything in a forest and then you, you're hearing the actors as they move around and talk. Um, so it's really a very kind of sensual 3d feeling experience. Wow, I'm excited about that. I I had thought maybe you were selling that as a because I listen to a lot of audio drama on like Audible. Uh, uh-huh. You know, I've just finished listening to one this evening about an AI thing, and oh. um, you know, this kind of audio drama is becoming a thing. Is I mean, it's much, yeah. but you know, it used to just be kind of BBC drama and you know radio stuff, but now, as you say, it's fictional podcasts um, and and audio dramas on uh, instead of audio books. Uh, so, is there an audio book of the ancestor coming out at the same time? There is. Yeah, there is. But um, it's produced by HarperCollins. Mm. So this is also the difference why I think that audio um, narrative, audio, audio dramas and narrative podcasts are really exciting is that it's such a new territory that authors can keep the rights for that and, and just do it themselves. We are actually um, this is the first time as far as I know, that an author has taken um, part of a book and made a companion audio drama and is releasing it at the same time. The ones that you're listening to on Audible, and there's some on Spotify, I think, and um, Gimlet uh, obviously did a number of audio dramas. Those were produced and they're owned by those larger companies. Um, And the writers actually are paid a fee. Mm -hmm. Um, so they don't have an ability to, for example, take the intellectual property and create something else with it. Um, but because this is linked to my novel, I kept all of it. And, um, you know, we paid for the audio drama ourselves and we did everything ourselves. So we own it. And that gives um, us huge leverage after it's out, if it's a success. Yeah. Right. Because then we can sell it elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So how different then was writing the audio drama um because of course you know you write memoir you write full-length novels are you written, I think you have no, a novella up as well um or, that I've seen and then you've got audio drama it's a very different form 
it's also different. <laughs> I love, I love obviously go pushing myself into different um, genres. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it, it was very different. But what was very freeing about this process is that I didn't have any expectations about what I would produce. Um, I also, in the beginning, didn't see it as something that would, I, I, did, I wasn't sure if it would ever be heard. Right. I, I just wanted to play with this idea. And I said, oh, I'm just going to write one or two episodes and see what happens. And I wrote I ended up writing three episodes and showed it to some, you know, some people um, who ended up being my collaborators. And it it just worked. Um, I think because I had no pr- I put no pressure on myself and I let myself kind of get a little bit weird with it. Like it, <laughs> you know, I just let myself go in weird places. Um, without expectations, it did turn out to be a really fun and sort of spontaneous feeling um, podcast. And and it was fun for me to write. Oh, yeah. And then uh, you did mention the film rights earlier of Angelology. I, I have looked into this, but I got to ask, you know, what's happening with that? So, it, well, it's actually quite exciting because um, the film rights reverted back to me in 2016, I think, 2015. And I've been trying to um, get a television show made from, you know, from Angelology, from the mm. books. Um, there's, and and we do have actually someone, a, a studio interested in doing it. There's some complications behind the scenes with getting, because Sony Pictures originally purchased the rights outright. Um, and so, this new studio would have to pay them back. And so there's some negotiating going on behind the scenes. But once that's taken care of it, you know, it very well may happen. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's all it's all happening um, in your... Well, everything's bubbling, right? It's like bubbling, bubbling, bubbling. Let's, you know, and I feel like in the next few months, it is going to all happen. But right now we're in the simmering stage. Yes. Well, I'm excited for you too. And as a fan of your writing, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of it. Um, so tell people where they can find you and your books online. So I am at, I have a website, um, it's daniellesoni.com and that's D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-T-R-U-S-S-O-N-I.com. I'm on Twitter, of course, um, and it's at Danny Trasoni and Instagram, just my name, Danielle Trasoni. Everything is on my website. You can find me um, there and you can link to all of my social media. But, you know, I send out a newsletter every week and that's been the most fruitful way for me to communicate with people. I have people writing back to me um, almost every week, actually. So if you would, you know, if you're interested in joining that um, community, the um, the best way to do that is to just write to me directly. And my email address is danielle at danielletrasoni.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Danielle. That was great. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. So I hope you found the discussion with Danielle interesting today. We certainly covered a lot of ground and we all have a different path in our writing life. And I love how Danielle weaves the literary side with her interest in the supernatural and uh, other things. So write what you love indeed and be flexible when it comes to your publishing career, as you will likely have to change direction as time goes on and the industry continues to change. In the next show, I'm talking to Austin Cleon about his book, Keep going. We talk about how we both feel after a decade in the industry, what is art and what is necessary for business, why you need a safe space for creating and why blogging is still core to Austin's process. In the meantime, please check out my new mini course slash lecture on multiple streams of income at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.